you'll take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 15, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 17 this morning, and as you're turning there, again, let me just remind you that we have the vote afterwards, and so please stay after if you're a member, and again, we're looking for a time of continual thanksgiving. What does it mean to praise and give God the glory and honor, and again, if I'm honest, I'm not a big fan of a lot of the tr- uh, traditions that we have during Thanksgiving. Um, I don't like turkey and stuffing. <laughs> and so, and I, I do try. I mean, we, we had Friendsgiving with the Yo Pros this past Wednesday, and we got uh, two smoked turkeys, and they looked wonderful, and they smelled wonderful, and I was sitting there cutting in, and I took a piece of the white turkey, and I was just like, Bleh. <laughs> dry. And then again, my wife during the week, hey, what's, uh, what's there to eat? Turkey and stuffing, blah. <laughs> By the third time, I was like, I'm not even asking anymore. So I'm not a big fan of turkey and stuffing. I'm not a big fan of people who stop when you're sitting down to eat the turkey meal, saying before we eat, now everyone's going to go around the table and say something you're thankful for. Because we know how that ends, right? So you try to be the first person. And you always say the same thing, I'm thankful for my family. And the second person that tried to get in there goes, gets angry. Mm, that's what I was going to say. Right? And so it becomes that time of just hard, hard expectations. And, you know, nobody ever gets to the place where they're saying, hey, I, I'm just glad I really got to share what I was thankful for. It was like, I'm hungry and I'm ready to eat. So let's get through this. I know we're living a day and a time where, again, you can get everything online and they start celebrating Christmas now in July. So you don't have to worry about Black Friday uh, things because they're open on Thanksgiving Day now. So you don't have to worry about setting your clocks for 3 o'clock in the morning and getting up after a day of Thanksgiving to go and abuse other people to get the thing that you want to get. So I'm not a big fan of traditions of Thanksgiving a lot of times, but I am very aware of who we're supposed to give Thanksgiving to. See, it's sad that we, it's only an occasional event that we have that's once a year. It started with a day of feasting, of feasting and giving thanks to God, and it started in 1621, we think. That's when we think the first Thanksgiving was between the pilgrims and the Native Americans as they celebrated a, a feast and a harvest that came after some very, very hard times. We know that George Washington made a proclamation in 1789. That was the first proclamation from a government in regards to giving thanks to God. But it wasn't until 1863 when Abraham Lincoln made it a national holiday for us here in the United States. So it's an occasional day, once a year. But for the Christian, it should be something that is, ce- that is celebrated every day. So I want you to look in your Bibles. We're looking at Proverbs 15, verses 13 through 17, but really putting the emphasis on verse 15. But hear the word of the Lord. A glad heart makes a cheerful face. But by sorrow of heart, the spirit is crushed. For the heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouths of fools feed on folly. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. For better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. And better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, this is your words. And so, Father, we ask your Holy Spirit to now come in abundance. Open our eyes and our hearts to see the truth of the difference of those who know you and those who don't. Or we recognize the world's understanding of hatred and a lust after more. But Lord, even with a little and with the saving grace of Jesus Christ, we can give you continual thanksgiving. 
from this time forward and forevermore. So be honored, be worshipped this morning. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. As we unpack these verses, I want to see two very specific things. One, we have cheerful hearts when we feed upon God, and that we're also those who have cheerful hearts begin to bless others around them. So we need to make sure that we get the vertical right before we work on the horizontal. And so we need to feed upon God. And so we need to feed first upon the Father. Now again, this word that's used in the Hebrew is a word for cheerful. It's one where it's talking about a good heart. Because we are to be in a celebration of worship all times. We're supposed to give God our worship and praise and glory. But if we're honest, it's far easier to complain, isn't it? It's far easier to look at just simply our lives and the things that are going on. It's easy for us to only celebrate or give thanksgiving every once in a while. And yet the call is for us is to have gratitude to God all the time. It should be a way of life for all of us, especially those who are Christians. But why is that? Because God is good. God is good all the time. It's why we talk about him being immutable. He does not change. He's always constant. And that's a good thing. He's constant in his character, and he's constant in his ministry to us. And he is a good father. And because he is constant and he is good, we should celebrate him because he does not change according to the circumstances. How horrible would it be for us to serve a God who simply changed his mind constantly or when it depended upon us in response? See, we celebrate who God is because he is not a circumstantial God. He is good all the time and he's perfect in his character and he's always perfect in his motives. And so we feed upon the Lord, but we also feed upon his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, why is that? Because we need to look, first of all, at the heart of Jesus. And Jesus had a heart for all people. The children loved him. And the children would come to him and sit upon his lap, and Jesus would talk to them. Jesus was grateful and cheerful with the women. He was grateful and cheerful with men. But he also went beyond that. He began to touch those who were unwanted those who were untouchable according to our standards. Jesus also had a heart for many of us who are ungrateful. Larry Crabb um, has a story about when he was a a child, he he thought he was a big boy and he could use the bathroom without anybody's help. So he climbed the stairs, closed the door behind him, and he locked it. And he said for the next few minutes, he was very self-sufficient. But then he got ready to leave, and he couldn't unlock the door. And so with every ounce of energy that a four-year-old could have, he couldn't open it. And so he began to panic. He said, I might spend the rest of my life in this bathroom. (laughs) My parents and likely the neighbors began to hear his desperate screams. His mom came up and said, are you okay? Did you fall? Have you hit your head? And he said, I can't unlock the door. Get me out of here. But what he didn't realize is that his dad had now raced down the stairs, got the ladder, leaned it against the house just beneath the bathroom window, and with his adult strength, he pried it open, climbed inside, walked past him, and turned the door and opened it. This is how he responds. Thanks, Dad. (laughs) And ran out to play. He says, that's how I thought the Christian life was supposed to work. When I get stuck in a tight place, I should do all that I can to free myself. But when I can't, then I should pray. Then God shows up. He hears my cry. Get out of here. I want to play. So God opens the door to the blessings that I desire. He says, sometimes he does. But now, no longer a child I'm realizing that the Christian life doesn't work that way. And I wonder, are any of us content with God? 
Do we even like him when he doesn't open the door we want most opened? When a marriage doesn't heal, when our kids rebel, when friends betray, when financial reverses threaten our comfortable way of life, when health worsens despite much prayer, when loneliness intensifies and depression deepens, when ministries die. See, God has climbed through the small window into my dark room, but he doesn't walk by me to turn the lock that I couldn't budge. Instead, he sits down on the bathroom floor and says, come sit with me. He seems to think that climbing into the room to be with me matters more than letting me out to play. Are we ungrateful to a God who so dearly loves us and gave his one and only son to die in our place. And he tells us, come and sit because of his love for us. Jesus said this from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, who is the founder and perfecter of our faith, and who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand at the throne of God. See, Jesus did come to pay for our sins, And again, as much as we complain, as much as we think this world is horrible, listen, it is minimal compared to what hell is. See, for Christians, this world is truly the most hell we'll ever experience. This is the place where we will experience people who hate us, people who curse us. We deal with sickness and pain and hardships in this life. But for those who are not Christians, this is the most love you'll ever experience. Those that forgive you, those that bring you into their arms when God heals, when God sets you free. And Jesus Christ endured that pain and our penalty so that we might never experience hell in its full extent. And so he does that through Jesus Christ, but we also feed upon the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the one who lives in our hearts, and so he allows us to have a continual feast upon God, a continual feast. He's the one who always links our hearts to the mind of God so that we live in all truth, so that we live in all joy. And as he does that, he works within us, works of good cheers, so that we're able to confess our sin, so that we're able to confess our bitterness, so that we're able to confess our ungratefulness, and that we rejoice when he says, I forgive it, and I throw it as far as the east is from the west, and I remember it no more. Do we rejoice in the gospel message? So as we feed upon God and we get this relationship right, then we begin to have an opportunity to begin the people around us and bless them as well. But it does talk about the individuals who we don't want to have around this Thanksgiving, right? He talks about those who are a curse in essence when they come into our lives. And the first one he talks about is the fool And the fool feeds on folly. And the fool, listen, he doesn't know any better, but not only does he not know any better, he doesn't care to. Listen to the words of Proverbs 26, 11, and 12. Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for that. That's, that's a horrible setting. If you read Proverbs 26, it's not 
it's not nice. It talks about, right before these verses, it talks about a man who takes his arrows and begins to shoot everybody. It's like a, a person who brings his gun and he starts to talk to you and starts to point his gun everywhere and you're like, whoa, put the gun away. What are you doing? They don't know any better. And God's telling us through Proverbs, he's saying a fool is like a dog that goes back and eats its own vomit. You ready for lunch? <laughs> That's a fool. And so God says, you don't want someone who's content with just being in folly because, listen, they lack the humility to receive correction. So again, this is where you can talk to your blue in the face. And parents, you understand that. Talk to your blue in the face and these people will not listen and become wise. But there's also the afflicted in verse 15. He says, there are those who are afflicted. And so what happens is in the, in the affliction that they hate, they begin to, to produce pain and hurt. And we understand that, don't we? When you find yourself in the midst of pain and, and, and hurt, and that's something that you experience just all the time, it affects who you are. I remember again when my parents got divorced and the pain and the hurt that it produces, I started getting to the place where I didn't care who I hurt. If I'm hurt, why doesn't everybody hurt? So I don't care if I hurt you. Welcome to the club. This world stinks. Let's just get through it. And if I need to abuse you to do that, so be it. Because those who deal with affliction provide pain and hurt to those around them. But there's also a third one that it talks about, those who hate. And these are people who, and again, in the course of our world standards, have reached everything. They have treasures. They have the fatted calf to eat from. And yet, they hate See, for those people, it always becomes everything is about me. And so if you get in the way of what I have or you take something away from me, there are the people who are just so hateful that they just don't even want you there. And so God says, why would you come to a meal where people don't even want you there? So we have the ability, apart from Christ, to become very cursed individuals and hurtful people. And again, these are not people we want to see at our Thanksgiving table, is it? Do you really want people sitting there being foolish? Do you want people bringing pain and hatred? But God says... As we are blessed by Christ, as we feed on the Trinity, we become a blessing to other. And there are those within this passage, and the first one it says is that person who is wise. Because the wise person always seeks understanding. They're never satisfied. They're always wanting more knowledge. They're always wanting to go deeper in the relationship. They're always wanting to go further in studying the Word of God. And I'm telling you, and again, it doesn't matter how old I get, there's always something new that I find in Scripture that I said that wasn't there before. Because God does that miracle for us. He allows us to grow in our understanding of who He is. He allows us to grow deeper in our love for Him and our understanding of His love for us. And so we always go deeper, we always go deeper. And so these people are the ones that would come into your home and they would listen to your stories and they would ask questions and they would continually point you back to Jesus. And they say, you know what? Here's how we celebrate Thanksgiving. You know what? This is who we celebrate. This is what should be a part of our daily lives. And you're energized when you're around these people. Even introverts like me. Because we love people who want us in their lives and want to know us in a deeper way and wants us to know Jesus better than we did the day before. 
So we want the wise people to come in, but we also want the cheerful. Because listen, God doesn't tell us that our lives are going to be absent of affliction. Verse 15 doesn't say there's those afflicted and then there's the Christians. Afflictions happens to all. But it says the afflictions that happen for those that are cheerful, it's in our heart. One of the pastors in regards to this passage says it's just as easy to sing in a prison as much as it is in a palace. Do we believe that? Do we believe that the little things as well as the big things are things that we look forward to? See, being Presbyterian, we can raise a glass of wine, a glass of beer, a mixed drink with friends and enjoy life. But does that mean more than if I take the little sponges and wet the lips of a dying friend? What's more? What's less? What about having everything that we want to have? Does that make us more happier than if we were to live in a tent? With nothing? But with the Lord and friends who love us? See, it's supposed to be something that's a continual feast where we look upon Christ and specifically we look at the greatest injustice that ever happened in the universe when Jesus died on the cross. Because God knew that had to happen so that we might become the sons and daughters adopted by the king. So we come with the wise, we come with the cheerful, and we come with those who love. See, and this amazes me, because I'm not a big one of salad. But better is it to have salad with love than the fatted calf. And I want you to even think about it. It, it, This is herbs, so it's not even a good salad. (laughs) Better to have a junk salad with friends who love you than to have the greatest meal with people who hate you. Do we celebrate the little that we have but the greatness of the Lord? Bishop Hall says this, the universe will not fill a worldly person, but a little will suffice for a heavenly heart. So where are we at? Are we okay with a little from the world, but everything from God? So here's my challenge. Will your thanksgiving be different this year? And not just Thanksgiving Day, but will you look forward to this year as every day thanking God for the little things and the big things? Because he has given everything for you and to you. and He never, ever deserts you. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Lord, we thank you for forefathers who did put into place at least a day to make a stop and to think, to minister maybe even to heal. But Father, that is way too easy for your children. Because Father, like Larry Crabb said, it's too easy for us to ask you to unlock the door so that we might go out and play and have fun. Father, may we sit down with you, spend time with you, 
fall deeper in love with you. And no matter the circumstances we find ourselves in, whether in plenty or in want, whether in good times or bad times, whether in times of happiness or sorrow, we will never cease to give you continual thanksgiving because we always have the feast with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May we live out this year in a spirit of gratitude, but always giving you continual thanksgiving both now and forevermore. Amen.